You're listening to the Inquisitive Red Podcast, the show that brings you philosophical ponderings of your life from a bird's eye view. Now, here's your host, Shah. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Inquisitive Red Podcast. I'm Shah, your host. Thank you so much for returning, if you have done. And if you're new here, thank you very much. I hope that you stick around. So today, I wanted to address the issue of worry. It's that time of year whereby a lot of people's worst fears come into play. And that's for a few reasons. One, we're approaching a holiday time and that alone can bring up a lot of concern, a lot of worry for people. The other issue is we're approaching the end of a year. So people tend to, whether they realize it or not, they tend to reassess and ruminate about what they have done, what they haven't done, what they've done well, what they haven't done well. And they tend to reassess and look over, look back upon the past 12 months. And of course, the third thing is they often judge that, but also coupled with that, they look to the future, to the new year, which can bring anxiety on its own, to correcting or changing, making some changes. And change can bring upon anxiety and fear. So I'm going to make a shocking statement, one that you probably have not heard before. Worry can be helpful to a certain extent. This may surprise you because most therapists spend a good part of their career trying to help people to stop worrying rather than helping people to learn to manage their worry. And we'll come to that in a bit because you can learn to manage your worry. I have learned through my own practice and through my own life as well that looking at things as a complete cure or that it's completely solved. And of course, some things in life can be, you know, you can eliminate things from your life. So that issue solved. However, sometimes the maybe the desire for something that you used to do hasn't gone away. So then you may judge it and say, well, it's not solved. So it depends on your perspective. But today, in terms of worry, worry can be a very healthy response to life, to life events, life challenges, and also life choices. It can mean that you are conscientious, concerned, caring, uh, ethical, rational. It can help to prevent reckless behavior or help to stimulate you to do your best or to take control of a situation. So sometimes worry is absolutely necessary and can be very, very helpful. Now, some people are more prone to worrying that's more long-term than others. And sometimes this can escalate to the point where it becomes a problem, when worrying is interfering or interrupting your life, affecting your health, affecting your well-being. The extreme to that is, of course, something like obsessive compulsive disorder, where you are focused and worried about numbers or times and sequences. And of course, uh, another issue would be it's affecting your sleep. So you are up at 3, 4, 5 a.m. worrying. So we have to look at the consequences of worry or how it brings about or manifests into what it brings about, how it manifests in your life and see whether that's helpful or not. So if worry manifests in a way that motivates you to affect change in a good way, then that's been worth it. That's all worth it. Also, I think it's helpful to look at worry as um, not necessarily temporary because it's something you may fall back on now and again. It may be helpful to look at worry as something you look to at particular times. It doesn't have to be a permanent part of your everyday life. 
with life changes, of course, and big decisions, uh, these really milestones that come up in your life, big birthdays, you know, marriages, house moves, buying houses, a new car, uh, new friendships, you know, perhaps um, experiencing a death, a loss in the family, real illness, things like that. Some of that will, of course, bring upon some worry. So what do we mean by worrying? What is worry? So the first thing I'll say about this is that worry and anxiety are very closely linked. I believe they're very different. I say very different, but they are different. I know about very yet, but I've said it. So perhaps I do believe it. Uh, so I, I think they are, of course, closely linked. But I believe the difference between worry and anxiety falls back upon something I was just talking about. So you may worry for a particular or about a particular situation. So for a particular time and about a particular situation. So it may be specific. It may be a decision specific issue. It may be a life issue. It doesn't mean you you have anxiety. So that would be the difference. Now, there is something called free-floating anxiety. I've talked about this in another podcast. It may have been the hypnotherapy one. But free-floating anxiety is something that just stays hovering over you in the background. There's just a little bit of you that's always anxious about something. So the easiest way, because people often ask me, well, how do I know I'm, you know, I have free-floating anxiety? One of the best ways I have found to try and sort of suss that out is to look at your behavior. So these are uh, things like the tapping of the foot, constant tapping of a, of a foot, or, you know, drum rolling a desk, um, biting your lip biting your nails, pulling your hair. Uh, the, these are perhaps some of the easiest ways to tap into how anxious you are. Not being able to keep still, uh, concentration being affected, uh, constantly querying and asking about something as though you're, you're just never sure. Uh, then again, we get into the area of being obsessive about it. So double, triple, quadruple checking something. So this is free floating anxiety, which can lead into anxiety disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. So for me, that is the difference. So you may worry because you've got an exam coming up and here's the worry. So here's how the worry plays out. It's always in phases. You will start at a particular gate. I like to see it as like a marathon. So you're waiting for that to hear the, you know, the gun pop off, you know, go where, where you can all start worrying now. So you, you've got the anxiety date. You're at, you're at uni. Sorry, you've got the uh, exam date. You're at uni, you've got the exam date. As soon as you get the date, you put it in your diary and the worry starts. So what's the exam about? That's what everybody wants to know. What, what's it? Is it, is it um, all uh, essay? Is it, what's it going to be? Is it going to be multiple choice? How's it all going to play out? So that there begins. Yes, some of it is you're curious. But some of it is preparation. Then you worry about whether you will pass or not. Now, there'll be worries in between. But the main, the biggest worry is how are you going to prepare? How are you going to get through it? How are you just going to do it? So even me talking about this can bring up some worry for some of you. So I will say this, uh, if any of this brings about extra worry, just take in a few deep breaths and what I will say is I know that if it's bothering you, then it's triggering something. And for you, that means this particular part is the part that you need to pay attention to because this 
is what's affecting your worry. So worrying is simply spending a good portion of your time thinking about difficult things, bad things, and being preoccupied with the negative possible outcomes. The more you worry, the bigger the worries become. And you may find yourself worrying about the fact that you are worrying. Take a step back and look at what you're worrying about. So a quick example will be when people fear the worst, the absolute worst. Now, movies are made about this, and a lot of movies make those worries, those, those fears come true. There's lots of examples like natural disasters, um, some animals call, cause worry. What if something gets in or, you know, a little spider or something like that? But worries come in all different shapes and sizes, as we all know, including gloomy or dark thoughts about your future so very gloomy thoughts you know like being ill when you're older that's a very gloomy dark thought uh or perhaps never having done you, the, the work that you wanted to do so that's a thought about the future so that's a gloomy why why wouldn't that happen you could take steps to help that to happen or about what is currently happening in the present time. So you may be in a job that you don't like, and there'll be worry about how you're going to solve this, how you're going to get out of it, what's your best course of action. And about what took place in the past. So if you've got a train, if you're on a train of worry, I like to call it a train because once you're on it, you can go from, from you know carriage to carriage, but that train, has worry on it. That train is going to the land of worry. You're on it. So you can keep going. You can start out in carriage one, go to carriage two, look at all the worst bits, go to carriage three, imagine all the worst bits, bits. go to carriage four, and you add on bits. If we look at these in turn, you'll see how they can impact your life. So let's start with the gloomy or dark thoughts about the future. When people talk about thoughts being dark, dark thoughts are really the worst. They're the, your worst fear, the worst thing you can imagine. Some people think that we're rarely in the present anyway, that we're always looking into the future. And I believe some of that. I believe that we are, we're looking at, if you really, really um, sort of narrowed it down to your daily life, and you'd have to take hour by hour, even uh, 15 minutes by 15 minutes, a hundred thoughts go through your mind, possibly more. Now, those thoughts may, let's say if it's 10 a.m., it could be, you know, are you going to have a hot drink for your 10-minute break or a cold drink? Are you going to have a bite to eat or not? Some fruit or, or something else? These little thoughts, it doesn't mean it's worry. Now, let's, let's uh, go backwards in time to 6 a.m. when you woke up and you had your shower, you, you got dressed. Now, if you take public transport, Whilst you're in the shower, you could be thinking, you hope the train isn't packed, or you hope there's no strikes, you hope it's all on time, you hope you've checked everything, you hope everything's okay. You hope you have your umbrella, it doesn't rain, all those kinds of things. Those aren't necessarily worries. They could be you planning your future. So I bring this up because some people think that we're rarely in the present. We're looking to the future. So it will be interesting to see your thoughts on that. You may worry about things that will probably never, ever happen anyway as well. And quite possible outcomes that are very likely to happen or very unlikely to happen. So, for instance, if you don't turn up to your exam, 
you will quite likely fail the exam unless you've made provisions to retake it. Now, you could say if you don't study for your exam, you're quite likely to fail it. That's not necessarily true. Uh, there's variables to that. You could say, you know, if you put your foot on an ant bed, you'll quite likely get bitten. That's quite likely to happen. Now, for example, uh, another example would be you might be afraid of what might happen at work today, or you might worry that you'll develop a fatal illness, or that you might be in a plane crash. So realistically, all of these examples present possible outcomes. Work could be challenging. You could develop a fatal illness. And if you fly, you could be in a plane crash. However, statistically, all three are unlikely when you look at the odds. I mean, you can do some research yourself on those odds. And you may have other examples you'd like to use. If you have a genetic propensity to a certain illness, there are preventative measures you could take and you could also seek treatment. So worrying about becoming fatally ill, there's some control over that, but some of it you won't be in control of. And I'm mentioning this because this is the foundation of worry. Worrying about things you cannot control. There are preventative measures seeking treatment. If you fly, you will know that plane travel is one of the safest forms of travel. And with the example of challenges at work, you could seek advice and get help with that, if that were indeed needed. So those gloomy, very dark thoughts are usually centered around your mortality or immortality. It, they're usually centered around you having no control over a situation. And if you can remember that part when you're worrying, that are you worrying about things that you've got absolutely no control over? Even when you drive a car, you could be the best driver in the world. But we do know other people on the road may not be. So you have control over a particular part of your life. And then there's the other part that you have no control over. And that is simply because you cannot control the outcome of everything. So gloomy or dark thoughts about your future is one of the things that most people worry about and have running in the back of their mind. Let's talk about present concerns, present day concerns. And so you may feel anxious about a situation in which you are powerless to change, similar to what I mentioned before, but also about situations that you can influence. For example, you could be stuck in a traffic jam. On the one hand, you cannot control other drivers. And on the other hand, you could consider a different route. So do you see the dilemma? You could influence the outcome. Sometimes if you use a sat nav, of course, a lot of us do, or Google Maps or, you know, whatever's the latest. Sometimes they warn you ahead of time that there's a traffic jam. Here's the possible second route to take. You've got a decision to make. So you're presented with choices. Those choices mean that you will have to make a decision. And quite a simple example is the queues in a supermarket. You try your best to choose the shortest queue. And then a new checkout's open and you're too slow. You can't get there. So you want to go back to the queue you were in before, but now that's packed. So you are, so we all have choice and isn't that a wonderful thing? And this is always something that's lost. It gets lost with worry. 
Most worry clouds the issue of personal choice, free will, the ability to make a choice, just like you have a choice to worry or not to worry. And so worry can include present day concerns in the moment decisions to make. And next will be thoughts and feelings about the past. Now, this can be quite a huge worry. And people often talk about being stuck in the past or always worried about the past. Just as it can be helpful to remember that you do have choices, it is also helpful to try and keep a little visual post-it note in your mind that past events are unchangeable. The thoughts and feelings around those events may still worry you. For example, uh, a failed relationship and a friendship that's ended. Maybe you didn't accept a particular job offer. These worries can play out different scenarios in your mind about what if. What if can be a very dangerous road to go down. And it can also be an enlightening road to go down as well. And there's usually two sides. So you could think about what if you made different choices. Those thoughts could help to inform you about future choices. And so begins the cycle. Sometimes it's a vicious cycle because it can take you down a rabbit hole. But sometimes just by examining those thoughts, they can inspire you to either behave or make choices, act in a particular way that helps you in the future. Your mindset and how you view the situation will determine if the issue could cause worry. For example, if you see the failed relationship as exactly that, failed, then you'll carry that around with you as a failure. However, if you choose to see the relationship as ending due to not being able to continue for your own well-being, then that changes your view and your mindset. It also highlights your decision. Even if it wasn't your decision, it can highlight the choices you made. It's no longer a failure. Instead, it becomes a historical event in your life, just like all things that have occurred in your life. It's history in the past, no longer affecting you in the present day. This is how you begin to learn to manage worry. Your thoughts dictate your feelings. Work on reframing your mindset about the past and you'll have no need to worry. Worry has to have some type of foundation from which to build. It has to have a blueprint from which to grow roots. And so some people have learned how to worry by emulating a parent, they're unaware of it, or a different dominant personality in their life. Some people learn from their peers, you know, just like language is learned from peers. It's helpful to examine where you learn to worry. I believe all behavior is learned and ways of thinking are learned as well. What is the difference between worrying and just thinking about things? I believe the difference is simple. Worry is when you think about something negative over and over again, imagining the worst outcome, the negative outcome, even though it's already happened or even though it may never happen, not knowing the outcome. You will add things on to that worry, such as what do people think of you or how could you have made that decision or why didn't you say something then? Not only do you think these thoughts, but you also fear the outcome or the possible answers to them. Possible, I say possible outcome or possible answers to them because you will never know for sure. 
And that is because it's already happened. If you're looking at the future, the same applies. It hasn't yet happened. Not only that, but you have no way of knowing if a person thinks ill of you or even remembers you. How's that for an ego check? Some people have worried about what people have thought about them when they haven't even been remembered. Just thinking about things will be uh, reminiscing, going down memory lane, memory keeping. This is the stuff that very good autobiographies are made of, um, good novels. So going down memory lane is very different. And that's absolutely necessary. It means your memory is working. I said that in a podcast with my friend Kelly, one of my earlier podcasts. That was such a wonderful time. So it was really nice to go down memory lane. And your thoughts about your past can help you to feel alive, to feel great, to, you know, reminisce about the fashions, uh, the language you use, the slang, other people around you, some here, maybe some not anymore, how you got to where you are now, what a wonderful, fantastic time you had, what a difficult time you may have had in, in particular ways. It means that you were living, you were living, you were in it, you were alive, you were participating in life. That alone is very positive. To worry is to fear. Fear is necessary and we all handle it very differently. So you may sometimes dwell on fear rather than challenge it or even accept that it's there or accept that there's nothing you can do about the situation. And you may sit in your fear. Sometimes you, you may have to. Sometimes you will have to feel your fear. When you lack confidence, you can sometimes disbelieve that you have the power or even the capability to act or to handle a bad situation. Building your self-esteem, building your self-confidence, increasing your self-confidence can be helpful in eliminating and controlling worry. It's important to talk about the effects of worry because it can really, depending on how much you worry, what you worry about, it can certainly inform how you live your life, your quality of life. As we know, probably the worst example would be when someone develops agoraphobia, when someone's unable to leave the house, uh, when someone is afraid of public speaking, that can affect their work life. Your body will react to fear that worrying has created. Mind-body connection, very, very strong. So when you're fearful and scared, your body will release certain chemicals. Of course, adrenaline being one of them. You may find yourself becoming restless, agitated, unable to concentrate, uh, sleepless, migraines. You may have migraines. You may have heard of the fight or flight response that has just naturally evolved in all of us to overcome and escape from anything that appears threatening to us. So adrenaline affects the digestive system and it can make you feel ill. This is when you could feel nausea. So the more you worry, the worse it can become. And a sudden rush of adrenaline can lead to uh, heart palpitations perspiration, I mentioned nausea, uh, increase in blood pressure, and it could make you quite unsettled. You could even get vertigo. Some people experience, if they have excessive worry, numbness on a particular side of their mouth or body. And of course, this could cause other worries. Those symptoms are really associated with things like stroke and heart attacks. So you can see how one worry that's manifested physically and affecting your body can increase your worry. The main problem that results in worrying though is sleep difficulties. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, email us at inquire at 
That's E-N-Q-U-I-R-E at theinquisitiveren.com. Be sure to check all social media, especially the Facebook page, for new topics being discussed. And if you can contribute, please let us know so you can be a guest on the show. Now, back to the show. If you are tense and fearful at night, you know, the time when your body has naturally grown to relax, unless you're a musician who likes to sleep during the day, you can feel worse because your body's natural clock will want to sleep, but your mind will want to worry. So neither your body or mind is getting rest. Once you lie down to sleep, all other stimuli are no longer available. So any worries lurking in the background during the day will then surface. You can then worry that you're not sleeping as well. So now you've got another worry. Sleep time is not the best time to try and fix whatever is worrying you. It will usually be there when you wake up. When you're already tired, worry can find your mind a breeding ground. It can see your mind as a breeding ground and you end up worrying much, much, much more. It's as though your brain is going, come on, I thought this was my time to have a break from all of all your worrying. But your mind goes, I'm the boss of worry and I'm going to worry. It's not helpful. And if your sleep is interrupted, if you wake up, if you've managed to fall asleep and you wake up worrying, you've had interrupted sleep, now you have trouble going back to sleep because you're worrying. If you have a phone nearby and now you're looking at the internet at 4 a.m. when you're meant to be up at 6, now you're worrying about all the stimuli. You're overstimulating yourself. So how can you go back to sleep? When we talk about managing this particular worry, you've got to manage your sleep hygiene. So rather than grabbing your phone, of course, you've got to use your mind to overcome, override the worry and start to think about relaxing, comfortable things. Something I have talked about before is Sometimes when you're younger, you do have these wonderful experiences. For instance, you can have, uh, you know, when you're young, if you're working when you're quite young, let's say 21, 20, in your 20s, early 20s, you're working, perhaps you've got to get up for, for a particular time. And it's one thing you hate doing, depending on your world. You could still love your job, but still hate getting up. And someone once said to me that it's usually those times when you find the most comfortable spot in your pillow or the most perfect position in your bed. But you know in five minutes you've got to get up. And how fair, how unfair is that to your mind and body? But when we look back at your journey to sleeping that night, Your mind wants a break from worrying. It's begging you to stop worrying. Please stop worrying. And yes, we talk about the eight hour sleep. Now, most people are lucky to get six or seven hours, depending. I don't believe everybody needs that time. A lot of people work perfectly well on five to six hours of sleep a night. People are different. Their minds are different. Their bodies are different. Just like we can't all eat the same foods, your sleep and what the body needs will vary. And if you work on giving your body what it needs, work with yourself to learn what it needs. Some days you will need more than five hours sleep. Some days you you may need eight hours sleep. Work on that. And this whole issue of, oh, sleeping in, yes, you may want to lie in at the weekend, but do you need it? Are you forcing yourself to sleep? Sleep deprivation is a real thing. So you may find that you're more stressed when you have less sleep. If it's attributed to worry, then that's something you can manage. You can work on sleep hygiene. So clean room, clean bedding, enough clean air, 
you could even consider having some air and do some air purifying plants in the room. That's often helpful. Maybe a humidifier, maybe essential oils and a diffuser. All of those things, of course, of course, always having a comfortable bed. All of these things will help. And to eliminate future worry about the following day, you could do simple things like you did when you were at school. Unless you wore a uniform, you could lay out your clothes at night. You could uh, do lots of different things to make sure you have to do less and less in the morning. You could prepare your you know, breakfast, perhaps, or lunch, whatever you need to do to help your journey along to eliminate the worry. And most importantly, you would need to work on your thoughts. Your mental health is a priority. Nine Peaches Therapies offers gentle and soothing therapy for your mind, your body, and your soul. These self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by providing what you need right now, be it confidence, positivity, restful sleep, or relaxation. The soothing, calming music has been specially composed to accompany the body of words created by me, an expert practitioner, to help you to achieve the best result. Reprogram your mind using the most gentle and effective guided meditations infused with highly suggestible hypnosis to rid yourself of anxiety, fear, stress, and negative thinking. These guided meditations can help you to clear and cleanse any unwanted energy that may be negatively affecting your everyday life. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day. Nine Peaches Therapies, Holistic Therapeutic Consultancy. Let's talk about loss of self-confidence. If you're someone who worries, it means usually that you do lack self-confidence because when you're confident, you worry less. When you feel that problems are mounting, you can sometimes feel that you're able to cope less. Feelings and thoughts of why me or I must be useless can come to the fore and this can increase your sense of helplessness and worthlessness. This then reduces your confidence and makes you more vulnerable to your fears. Suddenly your fears go, aha, that's it. That's what we can get. That's what we can use. So when you feel confident, you feel that you can cope and you can manage difficulties. You survive them. A lack of self-confidence can affect how other people relate to you and how you feel in your response as well. So a negative spiral begins, which can sometimes lead to things like panic attacks and free-floating worry or anxiety. Now, I've outlined, very much like what happens with worry, I've outlined for you the worst things that can happen, but I've also sprinkled it with some helpful bits that you can do to help you to manage your worry. But let's talk for a minute about what's unhelpful. So what's unhelpful is becoming obsessive about other things in an attempt to control something. So some people think if they know absolutely everything about a particular topic, then they can control the conversation or the narrative, how it all goes. What they're forgetting, this is a part of ego, process, what they're forgetting is that other people will have their own contribution, their own thoughts. They may have read other books that you haven't read about a particular topic. This means you've got to work on your fear about, it will usually be, if that's the case for you, centered around you not having enough, not being enough, not knowing enough. You've got to work on that fear because it is a fear because it's unfounded it's in the ether it's a fear we've got no evidence that you're not enough that you don't know enough what's also unhelpful is acting impulsively in order to feel as though you're doing something about it 
So for instance, uh, jo quickly joining a yoga class. You've done no research on the class, the people, the person teaching it. You don't know if you're physically fit to do yoga, if it's something you might enjoy. You just, you click the button, you pay the money and you've done it. And then you feel, yes, I've done something about it. When actually you go, you hate it, you're not good at it, you feel awful and it's something you never want to do again. So that's an impulsive buy, but it's also just acting impulsively and not really researching. It's better to do the research. Do you prefer relaxation? Perhaps you hate meditation. So do a bit of research. Mindfulness might be a better option. They're very different. What else would be unhelpful is not doing anything about the situation. So just perhaps resigning yourself to the fact that you're a warrior. I've heard people say, I, you know, I, well, I'm just a warrior. Yes, okay, so that means you're owning that. That means it's now a part of you, your moniker. It's a part of your personality traits now. And actually, worry is an, acquire, is an acquired behavior. It's something that you learn to do. So it means you can unlearn worry unless you like being associated with worry, unless there's something about it that you like telling people, I worry about everything. I love worrying. I love it. I hate it, but I worry about everything. It means you love it. Why would you keep doing something that you don't like? So doing something about the situation means that you would, again, connected to the one I mentioned before, you would, instead of acting impulsively, you would take control of the situation and either seek help. So you could go into counseling, psychotherapy, you could have hypnotherapy, you could, of course, talk to family or friends. You could listen to relaxing music. You could make changes in your life where you set aside an hour to read. You could do some exercise. You could start in the evening or early morning walk. Now, keep in mind, this means you must actually do something. This isn't saying, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. This is you actually having researched some options, made a decision, and you've done it, just like you've done with other things in your life. You don't have to continue worrying the way you do. The other thing that's unhelpful is not seeking any help. It doesn't mean you can do this on your own. If you've been doing it for most of your life, it means you'll probably need somebody who's, uh, you know, pretty objective to help you to stop it. Friends and family will just say, oh, don't be silly. Stop worrying. So that may be helpful with some issues. It may, even, it, it may even help you with this. But if you have found that nothing has helped, it means that you need to seek help through a professional. I think that one of, you know, recently the NHS has really got, well, not recently, it's been a few years now, the CBT route, uh, you know, looking at anxiety. Worry can be quite different, but I've looked into their programs and I know a lot about them. And some of the CBT remedies, oh, I was saying remedies, some of the CBT helpers, I think, will help a lot of people. I don't believe it's for everyone. But I think some of it is very basic. Some of it you will already know, but some of it is very helpful. And I would encourage people to look towards the NHS first because it's also free, but also it's something you could try. So you're ticking boxes there. At least you're doing something about the situation and you're also seeking help. So it's a good place to start. What's also unhelpful is isolating. So, for instance, perhaps you stop meeting up with friends because you think you worry too much. Now you start to worry about how they see you, how they're judging what you say or how you say it. So isolating yourself will only sit you alone with your worry. Very unhelpful. Distractions are more helpful. So going out with friends are good distraction. What's also unhelpful are drugs and alcohol. 
alcohol is a depressant, so it will get you down more and get you on that worrying track. How many drunks have you seen crying about something that happened in the past or angry about something that happened in the past? And, of course, drugs, well, the same as alcohol, not helpful, takes you out of the situation, you come out of it all, and the issue is still there. Now you're worried because you can't seem to stop the behavior. When you should take action. So when you should take action is when, well, let's start here. Everyone, everyone can have a nagging feeling. But this is not the same as feeling constantly worried every day of your life. Ruminating thoughts can cause severe anxiety and can also become a permanent part of your life. Whilst medication can be helpful, it's usually connected to more anxiety-ridden states, which is different from worry. It is often better to treat your mind rather than to numb your body. So I know I talked about the difference between worry and anxiety before, but I will just say as well to add to that, Worry would be something that you're doing for a very specific thing. And anxiety is something you just do because you do it. It's what you're used to doing, so you'll worry about anything. Absolutely any and everything. And you'll become anxious. Your body will react. Your mind will react. You could even be on medication already for it. Could be free-floating, so it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, you're still anxious. That's, those are some of the differences between worry and anxiety. So whilst medication can be helpful, it's often better to, you know, deal with what's going on in your mind so that you don't have to numb yourself out. You don't have to turn to drugs or alcohol uh, just to numb yourself. People can lead very busy lives and you may have several things on your mind. Everybody is doing the best they can. You may have one concern that may dominate your life at this particular time. At this level, though, you can become too anxious to even think or to act in a helpful or useful way. Everybody's been debilitated at one point by worry. And you, you may think, oh, I've never been debilitated by worry. Well, ask yourself some of the issues that you've had. You really led an active life, you've got family, friends you've had to deal with on different levels, relationships, whatever it is, work. Everybody's had a time in their life where they, you know, wrung their fingers or run their fingers through their hair and say, oh my goodness, what am I going to do about this? That is worry. And sometimes you can't make a decision. You're too anxious. So if you're a smoker, that's you. You know, smoking's a distraction. So you may think or act in an unhelpful way. So this is when worrying itself becomes a problem to tackle. And let's talk about what is helpful. Controlling your fears is helpful. So thinking logically, rationally, or even confronting a person. So sometimes people fear dealing with issues, dealing with things, dealing with people. Other people can present some of your worst worries. In fact, usually when we deal with issues about worry or anxiety, we're looking at how people relate to other people. So using rational thinking, logical thinking can help. And also working with strategies to confront situations and even confronting people. You may choose a different word because I know the word confront can cause worry in itself. But let's say tackle, maybe not tackle, let's say look to resolution. Look to resolve a particular issue or at least have your say. How often have you been silenced about a particular topic? It may be time to have a voice. What's also helpful is talking things over with someone, friends, family, a therapist, or online. Of course, take all the precaution when talking online. We're in the culture 
and in a time of oversharing. That Those are my thoughts. That's what I believe. I see so many people sharing so many things online and then they delete them because they realize they've overshared or they've invited some responses from people who don't know what they're talking about or who are unkind. So be very cautious about sharing things online. What's also helpful is writing out a list. Writing lists, things to do, things you want to do in the future, wish lists, pros and cons about a particular decision. Write out the burdens, the benefits. Write out who could support you, help you. I like to suggest to people to start writing out elimination lists. You want to start eliminating people or eliminating things. I didn't actually mean to say people, but, uh, but you know, it came out. So you want to start eliminating things on your list. It may be people. <laughs> so start eliminating things. That's me. I eliminate people quite quickly. <laughs> I, when I have, when you've exhausted all resources, they're out. So, Writing lists, things you want to resolve, people where you, you, you never want to have anything to do with again. Sometimes it can feel good to draw a line in that list. So who was I talking? Oh, yes, a podcast with Professor Ursula James when she was talking about being an author and writing about particular people in the book. Of course, using different names, but that is a release. That's a way to say, right, that's it. I've got it out. What's also helpful is taking helpful action. So taking a step forward sometimes, seeking professional help, again, take, signing up for a yoga class or a meditation class or a class just to learn something, that can often be helpful. Or buying that book you've always wanted. Now, this doesn't always mean heavy-duty learning. This could be a music book about one of your favorite artists, uh, this could be anything. Maybe taking up hobbies as well, crafting, music, dance, taking up hobbies, photography, even hiking. What's also helpful is being assertive. So this will mean confronting your fears. If you've always feared spiders, perhaps you could visit a, a well, I, zoos do have different species of spiders let's pick a different <laughs> different one whatever your fear confront your fears so what else can be helpful is being assertive confronting your fears whatever you're fearful of let's say you're fearful of failing your driving test be assertive take maybe a couple of more lessons uh, get some feedback from people maybe practice with different people in the car get feedback be open if you're concerned about giving a speech, again, practice, get some feedback. What's also helpful is being more in control, but realizing you've got to be in control of what you can control. Confine your worries to a certain time. So this is a part of being in control. You can learn to section off your worry. Perhaps you will only think about things from 12 to 1 p.m. That's it. Noon time, that's when you worry. Maybe it's 5 to 6 p.m. Be diligent about it. Get occupied with it. When you're done, when that hour strikes and you must set an alarm, you're done. You're done. And if worry seeps back, it's not the time. Stop worrying. And Get occupied with something else. What's also helpful is meditation. I often find for most people, guided visualization is really helpful because someone else is, is helping you to go to particular places, see particular things, relaxation, hypnotherapy is very helpful, and mindfulness. I would suggest you listen to my talk about hypnotherapy, uh, maybe the one about smoking, although I know, but, the, the, but I do mention in that about 
how skillful most hypnotherapists are with guided visualization. And we have learned to, it's not a script. We're, it's off the cuff. This is, this is a learned skill. And it helps you to go to places and tap into things. We, use, we learn to use particular language and words and scenarios and metaphors. You know, Erickson was a king of metaphors. And this really helps to affect change. So meditation, guided visualization, relaxation, and mindfulness. Mindfulness is excellent, very different from meditation. With mindfulness, you are sat or standing, whatever you choose to do, it's easier to sit. And you're focused on the moment, how your feet feel on the floor, how your bum feels in the seat, the temperature of the air, how your body feels right now, isolated out, how your head feels, how your shoulders feel, your legs, your feet. This takes you into a very confining space where you're only focused on the moment. Mindfulness is really effective. So much so that, of course, it's become evidence-based. So mindfulness is used as a part of dialectical behavioral therapy, which helps to treat borderline personality disorder, BPD. Mindfulness is not free floating like meditation. Your focus with meditation is to try and focus on the breath and to try and free your mind of these thoughts. And when people meditate, if you're not in the right frame of mind, it can cause a lot of anxiety and also in some people psychosis. So if you're prone to that, if you're unwell anyway, meditation is not going to be for you, but mindfulness will be. And of course, relaxation, breathing exercises, deep breathing. Breathing controls your blood pressure, your heart rate. All of these, and of course, guided visualization takes you a bit like mindfulness, but it takes you into particular areas for your imagination to tap into dopamine and that feel-good drug, and also to help you to confront some of your worries. What is also helpful is physical activity. So walking, exercise, lifting weights is an excellent way to tackle worry. For some people, some people have told me, because they're more focused on their reps, their repetitions, it takes away any concerns. All they're looking at is how many reps they're doing, how good to form they are. So it's a form of mindfulness, but it also helps to build the body and the mind, the strength of the mind. What is also helpful is, of course, improving your diet. So eating well, fresh fruits, fresh fruits. <laughs> I just combined fruits and foods. Okay, I made a new word, but fresh foods, and combating allergies. A lot of people don't understand that they're irritable because they're allergic to things. Now, things like dust, you can only control to a certain extent. And of course, if you've got hay fever, that's a whole different thing. But you can learn to combat your allergies, and that will help you to feel more comfortable. Some complementary therapies are very helpful, box and others. Uh, massage, acupuncture, all of these things, you know, reflexology, back massages, you know, deep tissue massage, complementary therapies, and we throw hypnotherapy in there as well, very, very helpful and can help you to combat your worry. And of course, medication can be helpful, not necessarily as a last resort, but if you're finding that your worry is really affecting your life, you've tried everything, it may be that you're now in the realm of anxiety. Certainly one thing that I always say to people, and of course I'm not a medical professional, I'm not a doctor, but sleep medications, this is common knowledge, can be helpful, but I would say as a last resort. Most sleep medications are addictive. And it's the last thing you want to do is to, to develop a medication addiction. I hope that's been helpful to you. 
to look at worry. Everybody's habit of worrying, because it can be a habit, is very different. And for more information, you can contact the Institute for Complementary Natural Medicine, the ICMM. I'll put all the details in the show notes, and I'll put a few other helpful links in the description as well. So thank you all so much for listening. Of course, if I can be of further help, drop me a line and I'll, I'll do what I can. And I'm always happy to help. Here's to a worry-free or a more relaxed or a very enjoyable holidays rest of the week rest of the month and rest of the year i have got another podcast coming i've got two more before we wrap up for christmas there's only the the christmas week that i'll be off and then i'll be back for another podcast we've got some interesting podcasts coming as well thank you to all of you who have supported the podcast thus far been very interesting i'm still enjoying it (laughs) that's the important thing and of course Uh, Thank you so much if you've subscribed to Apple and to the YouTube channel. Not all of the podcasts will be visual. Some will be audio for different reasons, really. But sometimes the the visual, um, well, it can be personal choice sometimes. But also, sometimes it's nice to have a little break from being on camera. So thank you so much for listening. Again, thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you on the next one. Here's to living with confidence, with esteem, with courage. See you next time. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.